Hello and welcome alone to After Hours with me, Alan John. This week, joining us, we have Professor Randy Ewald to share his career to U of I. Growing up in the Midwest, Professor Ewald has an admirable resume. Finishing his undergraduate degree in Iowa State, he moved on to MIT to earn his PhD in mechanical engineering in five years. He started his teaching in U of I in 2011, almost a decade ago from today. Now he's an associate professor conducting fundamental research in fluid mechanics and rheology of complex fluids. We went in depth of his past career, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. I'm Randy Ewalt. I'm originally from Iowa, born in Davenport, Iowa. In fact, one of these pictures behind me is my family farm oh. uh, back in Iowa, just on the other side of the Mississippi River there. Uh, yeah, grew up on the farm there. Uh, went to, uh, yeah, uh, graduated from high school there. Went to Iowa State University for my undergraduate, majoring in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and you know eventually found my way to uh, to Illinois here. So from the Midwest originally. Yeah. So uh, Iowa State, can you talk, tell us a little bit about your undergrad time in uh, Iowa State? And then I know you have a really impressive resume. The uh, you know the graduate student time in MIT. So both those times. Yeah, MIT was great too. Yeah. Uh, let's see at Iowa State. Well, I'll start at the beginning, which was that. You know, when I first got there, uh, mm -hmm. I think I was probably undeclared engineering or something, mm -hmm. but um, I really wasn't sure if I wanted to do engineering or if I wanted to major in music or if mm -hmm. I wanted to major in like high school education to be like a physics teacher in high schools or something. And so uh, I kind of started off not wanting to um, commit. I, I still mm -hmm. did undeclared engineering, but I kind of wasn't sure, right? Trying to keep my options open, undeclared engineering. Um, eventually I had to choose something. I chose mechanical engineering in part because it was like the least narrow of all of the other options. You <laughs> yes. know, it still kept my options open, which it certainly has over the years. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was involved in the jazz band my first year there too. did some music stuff just for a year. Uh, all sorts of other things was involved in a fraternity there, uh, which is a big part of the social, uh, connection that I had. Um, yeah, the uh, but Iowa State's a great campus. It's a beautiful campus. I think that's one reason why I liked it. You know, I went there because it was, of course, great for engineering, but it was a state school that had lots of yes. other majors in case I decided engineering wasn't my thing, you know, like all these things that I mentioned. But big campus, beautiful campus. There's a lake on that campus, Lake Laverne. It's it's really pretty. We, you know, there's a big central campus there where we played, <laughs> we played football uh, once a year. Um, and uh, yeah, great setting uh, to play capture the flag too. Yeah, it was it was really great. Good people, good place. Mm -hmm. The engineering program is fantastic. You know, still connected to people who are there, of course, since I don't live too far away these days. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was good. I uh, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, a few things. But maybe you want to prompt me with some other questions about some other aspects of that time. Yeah. So uh, I would I would be wondering what time in your undergrad career because you mentioned that you weren't too sure where your future career was going to go go into right not determine on whether this is a this is a set career path or not so at what point did you realize you want to go to grad school because you know not all the mechanical engineer students will go to grad school yeah that's a great question um so i didn't know anybody who had been to graduate school until i got to university and i had professors of course that mm -hmm. had phds um i was so naive you know like there was nobody in my family really that uh in my immediate family that had gone to four-year university so even that was kind of a new thing for mm -hmm. me um and so uh but but nonetheless um i like the the graduate school idea got implanted in me even in high school wow because there, there was i had this moment when i was probably in a chemistry class i remember and this mm -hmm. is also when i thought maybe i want to be teaching so the uh the chemistry teacher was having trouble explaining something i forget what it was you know, I like leaned over to my friend and explained it to him. And I think that I think the teacher got upset with me. And uh, I said, Okay, uh, Ewald, you you should just explain this to the whole class, then if you think you understand this, right, which I, I did, I stood up and I explained it to the class and people were nodding and seemed to get it uh, to the chagrin of, of, uh, of the teacher there. And you know, I, I you know, that and, and other experiences suggested I could figure out a way to understand complicated things, explain them to other people. The teaching thing was, you know, technical communication broadly, but teaching was maybe something I was good at. And in that moment, I thought, oh, teaching is cool. And I looked around at my high school classmates and I thought, maybe I want to teach people like this, but I bet college is better because if I were to yes. teach at college, maybe students are a little bit more likely to want to be in class rather yes. than uh, my peers here. And of course, with that thought, I thought, well, to do that, of course, you need to go to, you know, probably a PhD, even though I didn't really know what that was. Um, and so that's probably when the seed was planted in my mind. And then in, in undergraduate, 
you know, I, I realized more what that actually meant, you know, like that getting a PhD was not just, you know, learning out how to learning about how to teach. In fact, it's, it's very much uh, different than that, right? Getting a PhD yes. is learning how to generate new knowledge in the first place. Of course, you have to communicate that to other people, but that's the real essence of a PhD. And um, I had a great experience. Uh, my fluid mechanics professor, I uh, actually, after my, I, I had him first for thermodynamics. So my thermodynamics professor at the time, I did really well in the class and he said, oh, uh, you know, Ewalt, you should uh, maybe think about doing research with me. You're pretty good. You know, maybe graduate wow. school is for you. And that's probably the first time that somebody like enforced in a positive way that I might be able to do that, you know, who, mm -hmm. who knew what that was about. In fact, this um, instructor of mine, his name is Michael Olson. He's still faculty there. His PhD is from Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, <laughs> from our department, in fact. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, all sorts of connections. His bachelor's was here too. So I didn't even realize it at the time, but the first person who suggested that I should go to graduate school and do research, uh, had the Urbana champagne connection, uh, which is eventually where, where I am now, of course, as you all know. So, uh, during your uh, undergraduate time, how, how, how hard was it to, uh, balance out, you know, the social connection and the research and, you know, also figuring out what you want to do? Yeah, I was really busy. Uh, as an undergraduate, my, uh, my wife now, we were, we were dating then in, in undergrad. She likes to joke still that, you know, like I would schedule things like all through the night, you know, like <laughs> whether it was social stuff or classwork stuff, whatever it was, you know, like she would tease me about having a, a very scheduled, uh, uh, day planner or whatever. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was pretty busy, but I think the balance of, you know, I worked hard for the uh, the academic stuff uh, and the classes, of course, because I wanted to and I wanted to do well. But having the social side um, was was good to balance. It was super busy, but it was good to have these social things, you know. So like I said, in the fraternity, you know, there's all sorts of things to, to go on there and the social events and just organizing other things there. Um, yeah. I, how did I balance it? I don't know. It was pretty full. But I, I think I would say that I, I balanced it by giving myself other opportunities outside of just the classroom sort of experience. And um, yeah, you know, doing research in a Professor Olson's lab was cool. Uh, I ended up doing like tutoring and kind of like mini teaching assistant sort of things also, which I also kind of brought balance in a sense. You know, it wasn't just me alone in a library trying to study something. It was interacting with people and talking about the things that we were learning in the courses too. Yeah. So, uh, so when, uh, when your professor told you to, uh, maybe try undergrad research in uh, thermodynamics or fluid, was that the moment that you decided that's the field you want to go into? No, I, uh, no, not at all. I was very thankful for that. Uh, and it certainly influenced me, you know, I got great experience there. Actually, I was working in a clean room. I ended up doing microfluidics for that mm -hmm. undergraduate project and learned how to get dressed up in the clean room suit and do all of that, uh, which was great. But by the time I got to the end of my undergraduate, that's not at all what I wanted to do. In fact, what I wanted, oh, I wrote all of my graduate school applications uh, related to green energy and sustainable technology. And some of them, I even said I wanted to like do something on the political side because that seemed to be where the solutions needed to be yes. coming from, you know? Um, so no, I, I, it, it, yeah, I, I was, I certainly uh, was all over the place and uh, had great internship experiences with, uh, with the aerospace industry, with the space shuttle program. Um, uh, yeah, so it was, was definitely all over the place. I think I eventually ended up choosing my area of research, um, though, be, because of a person. So when I was visiting MIT as a prospective graduate student and meeting all mm -hmm. these great faculty doing cool research, um, you know, the, the, the person, the people who became my uh, advisors, I was co-advised there by Gareth McKinley and Pekka Hosoy. I saw... Gareth uh, give like a lunchtime seminar talk to the folks who were visiting as prospective graduate students and the way that he thought about problems and the cool things he was describing. That's when it struck me like, this is the sort of person that I can imagine working with, you know, it was more like his style and his approach and his way of thinking that I, I really saw reflected in like the way I thought about the physical world and engineering. Uh, and it turned out to be true. So I was advised by him and co-advised by Pekko Hosoi, who was all, like, they were, the, in my view, the two best people in that department, right? I got along with them so great. They were wonderful human beings who were brilliant, but kind and, you know, collaborative. And it was, it was great. And I think it was the, the people that I interacted with that probably set my path more in terms of what research area I ended up going into. 
wow. So it it really wasn't just you had a certain determined mind that I want to work on fluid or anything. It was just that the interaction with people. You're like, wow, yeah. these, these are the people I want to work with. Doesn't matter what object it is. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. It, so I got some great advice from um, another undergraduate mentee or mentor that I had at Iowa State, Dale Cimenti, Professor Cimenti, who's also still there. He's in the aerospace engineering and mechanics department. Um, and uh, I did a little bit of undergraduate research with him and non-destructive evaluation, which was super cool. And he's a brilliant guy, just, uh, mm -hmm. just great. Um, and he gave me some advice. He says, you know, um, when you go to graduate school, the, the research area that you choose is certainly important and has an influence on your career. But the people you work with and your advisor will matter even more. And so he was the one who planted this idea in my head that the person you choose to work with is going to dominate your success and quality of life and, you know, your satisfaction in what you're doing. And he was totally right. And by the way, that advice applies not only to graduate school, but I find this applies to almost every work scenario that I've been in. You know, the person who's your manager has a pretty strong influence on your quality of life and job satisfaction and therefore life satisfaction, right? So finding good people can make a huge difference uh, in, in, in no matter what you're doing technically. Awesome. So, uh, Let's focus a little bit more on your graduate student time. Uh, sure. I'd imagine six or seven years. Uh, I was at MIT for five years. Five yeah. years. Wow. Yeah. What was that like? Uh, first time out of you know Midwest and in the Boston area. Yeah, it, it wasn't my first time out of Midwest. I lived for eight months out in Southern California for oh, an internship, okay. which was mm -hmm. great, and bought a longboard surfboard, and uh, it was yeah, I had, awesome. had a great time yeah. down there also. But um, yeah, it was uh, you know five years living out there uh, was very much out of the Midwest. Um, Boston was a great city. Uh, MIT was a great university. Um, I loved it there. There, uh, I found people there who thought the way I thought. I've mentioned that already with my advisors there, yes. but but other people too, like the way of thinking there somehow matched well with how I thought about the world. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and I've struggled over the years to try to articulate exactly what that way of thinking is. And I, I continue to try to figure out how to explain that. And I can't fully explain it. Um, if students have taken a class with me, maybe they see it like, uh, I don't know, the way that I approach a problem or the way that I think about things. Um, and I'll leave others to judge if that's good or bad or otherwise. But, you know, I have my certain style. And I found a lot of people there who think that way, which was awesome. Hardworking people who want to figure out what's going on, mm. who just keep asking why, right? Like you get an answer and then you ask a little bit deeper. Well, but why is it that way? Yeah. Uh, and it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found great people there who are, who are much more collaborative, I think, than I might have anticipated. There are some people who, um, you know, say scary things about MIT. Oh, it's yeah. very hard there, and people work very hard, but they they only care about themselves. And you find those people there for sure. But I, again, I managed to find great people, graduate students who I'm still really great friends with, or postdocs who are there mm -hmm. uh, that I've kept in touch with, and a lot of great relationships that came from that time. Wow. So uh, during your graduate time, you focused on uh, fluid mechanics, or what specific area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was in the mechanical engineering department there, mm -hmm. uh, and my research area was uh, fluid mechanics, but very specifically non-Newtonian fluids and rheology, um, it, which is a very interdisciplinary area. Traditionally, most of that knowledge generation, the textbook writers, were actually coming from chemical engineering departments rather than mechanical engineering departments. That's partly because <clears throat> a lot of the chemical industry was responsible for making these complex fluids. Mm -hmm. Polymer processing was certainly uh, thought about in mechanical engineering in terms of the manufacturing portion of mechanical engineering, injection molding and film blowing and stuff. There's fluid mechanics involved, but somehow the, the larger uh, portion of people came from chemical engineering. So I was in Mechie, uh, my advisors, it turns out actually neither of them have a, had a degree in mechanical engineering, though both of them were faculty in the uh -huh. mechanical engineering department there at MIT. Um, Garrett's degrees are in chemical engineering and Peco's degrees uh, were in physics, kind of an applied math, uh, physics sort of background, which I loved, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why I loved it. It was interdisciplinary and different ways of thinking. But yeah, I got into complex fluids there, non-Newtonian fluids, uh, and, and have had that as my core research area ever since. Yeah. Wow. So uh, right after the uh, PhD, you went to postdoc in uh, University of Minnesota. Well, what was that yeah. like? Back, yeah, that's kind of right. back to Midwest. Yeah, it was like coming back to the roots, sort of, right? It was as close to home as I had been in yes. five years. Uh, Minnesota was also awesome. I got this really cool position that was kind of a free agent postdoc at this place mm -hmm. called the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. 
almost everybody else there was a mathematician. So I was a little out of place, right? All my degrees were mechanical engineering, yes. but I guess they decided I did enough uh, math that they would let me in and let me hang out with all those folks. But it was cool. It was, it was also a great chance to be interdisciplinary because, you know, applied math can be applied to so much of the physical sciences. Um, I got connected with a really wonderful mentor there, Chris Macosco, who I still work with. He's now professor emeritus there, but um, yeah, still in close contact with him. He wrote the textbook called Rheology, mm. uh, which is something that I teach from in the, the elective course that I give here. And uh, that has started just a great relationship. So basically, as soon as I arrived there as a postdoc, uh, Chris Macosco uh, invited me to help him teach um, his course on Rheology, which went very well and and he too like had a great way of thinking about things and we we meshed really well and he's invited me every year since to help him teach these short courses every summer on rheology and so we've just continued that relationship we're now trying to write a book together the second edition of his book mm -hmm. uh on rheology it's it's been great so being at minnesota was just outstanding in terms of intellectual scholarly activity uh, yeah. was great for me as a place to live. It was also pretty cool. You know, it, it was a kind of a connection to where I grew up because it's, um, uh, you know, up the Mississippi river. And so I would mm -hmm. have maps up in my office that had like all wow. of the Mississippi river to remind me, like, you know, that yeah. I was kind of connected to where I grew up, which was, um, in the quad cities area of Iowa, just on the other side of the river around Davenport. Um, yeah, and Minnesota's cool, especially in the summer, but in the winter too, I met some great graduate mm -hmm. students there who, um, one who's Canadian who uh, knew how to play hockey and wow. Minnesota does some great stuff in the winter because it's so cold that in their yeah. city parks, they'll set up ice rinks. Yeah. I was going to say, it's not, not only, it's not only cool, it's literally really cool in the it's, winter. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, so it was great. So like I learned how to play pickup ice hockey there in the wow. city parks with people. And again, just form some great friendships and relationships mm -hmm. with folks that, uh, that I'm still connected to. Yeah. So right after that, you, uh, you got an offer from U of I and uh... yeah, from there. Uh, yeah. After two years uh, interviewed and got an offer here and mm -hmm. um, yeah, ended up taking the offer here and that's where I've been for almost 10 years almost now. That years. was 2011 when I started here. Yeah. So uh, what, what are like some of the uh, decisions that you have to make to, you know, come here and, and once you're here, why do you choose to stay? Yeah. Um, when I first got here, I would tell people that I love Illinois because uh -huh. people here are nice. That's true, but it's not the whole story. <laughs> yes. Because, I, you know, there are lots of nice people other places, not yeah, every place, uh, and not all the people at every place <laughs> either. But, um, you know, there, there are nice people at other universities, nice faculty, nice students. But what makes Illinois even more special is this combination of people who are nice, genuine human beings who are also really, really smart. Mm. I love this combination to have a deep conversation with somebody, whether it's in engineering and the sciences or mm. anywhere across campus or people in the community, even, but especially on campus, you know, brilliant students, brilliant faculty who can keep up with discussions very quickly. And they're nice, decent human yeah. beings. This is great. You know, you, so you hear in all of my story as I'm sharing, like I'm drawn to places where there are good people you know, in, in a broad sense, good people. And Urbana-Champaign is one of those special places where people are good and really, really smart. And that's the special combination here from the students throughout the faculty and staff and the community even. It's a great place. That is amazing because uh, from my first interview with uh, Professor Jacoby, uh, he also mentioned the same thing because he used to work in uh, Johns Hopkins and he would mention that it was a nice place, but Baltimore just gave the people generally a different kind of vibe comparing to U of I. As, as in term that people are not super nice in term yeah. that he, here he can he can even talk chat with the busher in the in, in the supermarket or you cannot imagine that happening in in baltimore <laughs> yeah i can imagine yeah the big city feel changes things cities yeah. are cool i mean i've enjoyed my time in cities too but mm -hmm. um but yeah mm -hmm. I, I i agree with professor jacoby i think we both mm -hmm. appreciate that aspect of urbana champagne yeah so uh where do you see yourself in terms of you know in the future in your future career path more into the research or uh... future career path yeah dangerous question i yeah. love what i'm doing i you know the um my brain is so wired to uh, find satisfaction in discovering new knowledge mm -hmm. in communicating that to others and and that's so much uh, in solving problems generally too as an engineer i love being a faculty member it is mm -hmm. like for me and the way my brain works probably the best job ever for me, you know, like the, I mentioned the textbook writing, which is super great. And yes. the teaching is so satisfying to be able to figure out ways to 
unlock understanding for other people is, uh, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm really contributing when I mm -hmm. do these sorts of things. This yeah. is great. I, I can't imagine a better job for the way that my brain works, you know, and I, I wish the same for all the students who might happen to be listening to this right now, yes. which is, I, I'll, and I'll just take like a big picture step back, like how lucky are we in the course of human history that this is even an option that we can That's think great. about sculpting what we do day to day that just keeps us alive to be something that also brings us joy come on like welcome to the you know scientific industrial revolution where these jobs even exist where rather than you know being scripted to a life where i just have to work on the farm because that's where i am and there's no other option you know so you know if for all the students who are in our program i mean it's just such an amazing time to be alive that uh you know across engineering there's exciting things happening or maybe you finish an engineering degree and you realize oh actually i think i'd rather do something else right but you still have a choice which is uh which is fantastic oh that's that's absolutely true yeah i, I haven't even thought about that but i i i guess i've answered a similar question before that when someone asked me like what would be what would be the best time to live and i would no doubt just answer now because you know why would you ever travel back to the time because you know you, you won't never have opportunities like today or you know yeah. technology or the lifestyle is just it's it's not it's same similar things never happen in history until today so yeah yeah you're right you're right and we don't know what the future is so it's hard to say oh, yeah, that that's, that's going to be better necessarily mm -hmm. right we hope to make it a better world yeah. than it is today but who knows so professor can you share some of your uh projects that you really find, you know, truly interesting and, you know, keep, keep your grinding, even though it's hard, maybe some of the application of your research. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to share a little bit about that. Um, so, uh, you know, just to talk in broad brushstrokes, you know, we are interested in research with materials that are somehow in between fluid and solid. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of the undergraduates in Mexi will take fluid mechanics, whether that's yes. TAM 335 for the engineering mechanics students or ME 310 for the ME, three, uh, for the, uh, ME students. And I've taught both of those courses. And you'll also take a course, both of uh, our majors will take TAM 251 solid mechanics, another mm -hmm. course that I teach. Our research area in my lab is like the love child of those two areas. So like what you learn in fluid mechanics and what you learn in solid mechanics both come to bear on these complicated materials that are somehow in between, you know? And so like mm -hmm. there's acute stuff that's, you know, many people have known for many years, like the oobleck cornstarch and water and the silly putty that bounces, but then it flows. You know, uh, many of us, especially in the U.S., silly putty is a popular toy. And so we see it from the time we're a kid. So we've seen these for a long time. And, you know, the research area I find so interesting because it's about trying to mathematically describe how these materials work at all, understanding the physics of why they're behaving in these peculiar ways. And that's just so cool. Like it's kind of defying fundamental definitions of what we even mean by fluid and solid. And the applications are really exciting too. You know, like you can do really cool things by making a fluid kind of weird and non-Newtonian. And so one common way to be non-Newtonian is start with water, throw something into the water that makes it kind of gel. Maybe something like actually hand sanitizer doesn't start from water. It starts from alcohol. Mm -hmm. But you throw something in there to turn it into a gel, and that's non-Newtonian. <clears throat> Hair gel is kind of this way also, but uh, you can do this and do some cool things. Uh, so, for example, you can take water that would be in a fire truck, a 500-gallon fire truck, add some additive to make it more like a gel so that it still flows through the pumps and it flows down the hose and it sprays mm -hmm. out the nozzle. But when it hits and impacts whatever you're spraying it on, it'll stick and apply a mm -hmm. coating that doesn't just flow away because... At low stresses, this fluid actually acts like a solid. And you see this in the hair gel hand sanitizer situations where like air bubbles are trapped in there. And this is cool because it looks like a fluid when it's flowing, it sticks on the surface, the coating is not flowing at all. And it's great actually by making fluids this way, you can put out fires better than with water alone. Oh, and so this is actually used in wildfire scenarios sometimes and uh, some uh, urban settings also. And so this has motivated um, one line of our research is to understand the physics of droplets of these complex fluids that impact and they might splash trying to understand fundamentally what's going on there. Like you may want it to splash, you may not want it to splash in a real application, mm -hmm. but nobody had even asked the question from like a fundamental fluid mechanic standpoint, how can we even predict if it's gonna stick where we spray it or if it's gonna splatter back? And so that's motivated a nice thread of our research that's been a ton of fun to think about, wow. uh, you know, how, what, what properties do you design into the fluid to make it stick uh, or not? Yes, wow, absolutely. Um, so, I switch back to a little bit about more general broad question. Uh, 
for the past year, as we all know, COVID and everything's been different. How has this, you know, pandemic influenced your job in terms of your, your teaching or your research? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a big question, of course. Um, okay. There's good and there's bad. So let me try to find the positive first before we can commiserate together yes. over the bad thing. So what's good about it? It's forced um, a lot of professors to figure out how to record their lectures, uh, which yes. I think is good for the students. Um, I was trying to do this even before when I would give lectures on campus, I would, you know, use the tablet and record and stuff and students seem to value that. And now I'm very happy to see so many of my colleagues who are now doing that out of necessity now, but I hope that it sticks and they get used to it. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, it's uh, what else has been good about it. Um, Boy, in terms of research, teaching, uh, you know, it, I, I'm glad that it's um, normalized the idea of working from home and mm -hmm. still being able to connect with people. Although productivity is down, I think, in many ways, at least from my own sphere of influence, um, the uh, the ability to work remote has been kind of nice at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have several international collaborations. And so meeting over Zoom or Skype is, you know, we've been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. But having those meetings with people who are nominally at the same institution hasn't been so common, right? Like the That's assumption true. is, well, let's yes. just meet in person, you know, yeah. which can be really good sometimes. But, you know, personal situations come up or whatever it may be. And I, I think it's good that we're helping to normalize at least a little bit this idea that somebody might need to work from home to, you know, take care of a kid or whatever this might yeah. be, and they can still participate and be connected to these things. And similarly, I think for conferences that I attend, I've seen a lot of these who have had to, they had to be remote, of course, over the last year. And this is great, you know, for like inclusion of people who may not be able to travel because it's expensive, or again, like they have personal, you know, commitments to something where they live and so they can't travel. Um, or they care about their carbon footprint and they don't want to jump in a plane to fly, you know, four time zones away just to interact with people yes. that could happen online for a much lower carbon footprint. I think this is good too to again help normalize that and maybe find ways to have these more inclusive hybrid meetings of people. Um, so that's all good. Of course, the downside, you know, I do not enjoy lecturing from my home office to, you know, TAM 335 this semester. That's, you know, um, I, you know, I, the students are great and I'm happy for the connections, but I'd feel much more connected to see everybody in person, you know, yes. and there's something about, I think, you know, like motivational psychology of humans where we've, you, you know, the way that we look at the world and the way that our emotions respond to things, we respond to faces and we, we respond to situations where we see a lot of information and we can cut out all the stuff that doesn't matter to focus on what does matter. And it's harder to do that in a screen than it is in person when you have depth of interactions. And it's it takes so much away from the way our brains have evolved to work that it's a lot harder. And I think a lot of us are not as productive because of it yeah. and maybe less satisfied because we're not getting the typical typical thing. I'm lucky, you know, I've got a family, a couple of kids, and so I get some social interaction, but I know a lot of people who have been very isolated over this last year because they had to shelter in place and maybe they have one roommate or maybe they live alone. Yeah. And so it's, it's a lot harder to interact only over a screen like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of, you know, when, when things get gets back to no, normal in soon, in hopefully soon future, hope. yeah. yes. Uh, what do you see anything will be changed because of you know, these past experience? I'm going to just touching on the same points I raised. I, I think that more people will record their lectures, even though mm -hmm. they're giving them in person, because I think they'll be more comfortable with it. And they'll yes. realize that that's a benefit to some students who want to, even if they're attending in person, they want to watch it again. Mm -hmm. I think that it'll normalize people maybe working a little bit more often remotely, especially in cities where there's a big commute, you know, like yes. knowing people who commute one hour one each way to work, you know, to like trade those two hours to work from home and you can still be just as productive for a couple of days a week. That's awesome. You know, that's and I, I think that that's going to help even there, like back to carbon footprint stuff and how we try to be more efficient with our time and usage of resources. I, I think there also be some benefits of things that might stick around. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, Outside of the work, uh, you know, obviously, Professor, you're a very busy man, just from your description. Uh, how do you balance your, you know, family life, your personal life in terms of, you know, all this work? I, I, I know you mentioned that back in undergrad, you, you said you, you just work really hard and plan everything yeah. out at night. But yeah, once you're a family man, what do you do with those things? Yeah, maybe, Alan, you're asking good questions. I think... Um, Balance has come from me having a family, which forces me to do other things rather than being consumed by work. You know, like I value having breakfast with my family and having dinner with my family. And so because of that, it's sort of 
forces a balance to my schedule that I'm not staying at work through dinner and through the night. Like, you know, I have to come home. And uh, although it adds other things to my schedule, it, it helps to enforce that balance. Um, in graduate school, I was married in graduate school. Actually, we had our first kid uh, when I was a, a graduate student out there in Boston. Who, so he was born out there in Cambridge. And again, like, you know, it, it added more to the plate, but I think it, it like brought even more balance, right? Like it, it creates something else in my life that uh, was going to be there. I, you know, I was going to embrace it. And uh, things are very busy, very full schedule, you know, had to have high energy to keep going through all of those things. But um, that's, I think, where the balance came from was like enforcing the balance with the certain structure of my life and the schedule that I wanted to keep. So when you have free time or, you know, when you try to balance your life, what are some of your, ho some of your hobbies? Yeah, uh, you know, during the pandemic over this last year, I've taken up road biking in a way that I hadn't before. I had uh, been a mountain biker before that, but I finally bought a road bike about a year ago. And I've really enjoyed that around the uh, the county roads in Champaign mm -hmm. way better than I would have expected. You know, like yeah. most most county roads and most counties across the state aren't going to be nice blacktop or, you know, like smooth. Uh, they're yes. just going to be gravel. It's great around here for road biking and a lot safer than I thought it would be also actually once you get a little bit out of the city. It's so, uh, so quiet out there. So that's been kind of cool. So that's been a big thing this last year is to get out, you know, for an hour or two when I go. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helps also remind me of um, just the land that is surrounding us, you know, like living in a neighborhood or close to campus, you know, it's a pretty high population density, but, you know, the average uh, land in Illinois is not that population dense, you know, it's a lot that's of farmland true. or whatever yes. else it might be. And uh, getting out in the county is a great way to, to remind myself of that. So anyway, that, that's one thing, certainly playing with my kids. Uh, we just put up the trampoline this past weekend oh, in nice. the backyard. And so mm -hmm. they're always inviting me to do stuff like that. And uh -huh. uh, so that's, of course, a big, big thing, too. And then uh, I'll read for pleasure also. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, whatever is grabbing my interest, whether it's an audiobook uh, or other things that I'm picking up or a suggestion from somebody. So what are some, you know, can you give us some example of what kind of books does Professor Randy, you know, read, you read? <laughs> yeah, one that I have loved that I read, um, I first read in 2018, and I have to recommend it to almost everybody. It's on my shelf here. It's called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. Hmm. This is written by Yuval Harari, who's, I think, one of the best thinkers of our time. Uh, he's a professor in Israel. He was educated at Oxford for his PhD, um, but he's great. So this is, the, the subtitle says it all, A Brief History of Humankind. He basically, like, takes the whole of human history back to Paleolithic times of our ancestors and uh, helps to rationalize why we are the way we are now and where our culture came from, whether we made deliberate decisions to start doing agriculture, for example, right? But we're trapped in it now because uh, it's just the way things are. And other things like this too, it's, it's great. And he's such a clear thinker. It's a, it's a great book. A little heavy, uh, I would say, and maybe hard for an undergraduate student to just pick up on the side, but, uh, but it highly recommended, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so Professor, this is the, I think this is the first year you've become the uh, advisor for SME. Uh, how, right. do you like, how do you like our, our organization has been doing so far especially in the pandemic time and uh, where do you see you can, you know, help us envision the future a little bit? Where do you want our organizations to, you know, keep growing to? ASME is great. Uh, I, I was a student member of ASME. I love ASME and I love uh, that it's such a thriving student organization in the department. Uh, so it's been really fun to see that a bit more firsthand by being the faculty advisor. Um, I, things are great, you know, like I see the email come out that has information yeah. about the different committees that are doing things, the different activities. Uh, it's fantastic. And I think it really adds a lot to the culture of the department and things like this, Alan, that you're doing to, you know, kind of connect across more from students to faculty. It's great. I mean, keep crushing it. Students have such great ideas. And uh, it's fun to see you guys uh, taking off with these things. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I guess that goes to my last question. So what's it like, you know, life living in the CU area, Champaign Urbana area, where where do you want to hang? Where do you usually like hanging out with your family or friends, or uh, what's your favorite restaurants? You know, things that only in Champagne. Some favorite things in Champagne. Uh, well, let's see. Um, gosh, there's just so many smart people here. It's just a delight. To like, it, and it's a small enough community that you see people in multiple places, right? So I don't know if a, as a student, you, pre, you can uh, notice that or not, but, you know, being an adult living in the area, you know, like the, the colleagues and the staff that are on campus, we bump into them other places, whether it's like at a sporting event or a, going to see a concert uh, or our kids playing soccer together, whatever that is. 
and that's pretty cool. And this is just a comment on the size of the community that, you know, living in Minneapolis, St. Paul and Boston and outside of LA, you know, these places are all bigger in a way where it's very rare to just bump into somebody else again yes. that you're working with because it's just a bigger area, right? And so that's that's a cool thing that that um, is part of the experience living here. And the people are just great. You know, a lot of people who live here aren't from the Midwest. Oh, yeah, but, that's true. But I think those, those who live here who stick around often have very... Um, let's say Midwestern sensibilities, you know, like they just feel like they're nice people, genuine people interested in others and wanting to make connections. And it, it makes it a really great place to be when people are smart and nice, you're surrounded by great people. Um, so anyway, that's something that I, I really like here. I, and I think that, you know, I probably made friends here faster than I had in other cities that where we lived also for these types of reasons. Um, uh, University is great. Like the arts and culture scene is awesome. So a couple of things that I love here. So um, I mentioned uh, that I, I uh, that I'm a musician. I played trumpet in uh, yes. in high school and in college, uh, and and still do just a little bit. And so I got to see a famous trumpet player, Winton Marsalis, came to the Cranert Center for Performing Arts with his Lincoln Center Jazz Band a few years ago. So he's like the band leader who's playing. So first of all, like it's cool that I can see this uh, performance at all, right? Yes. Uh, but then I got to meet him afterwards. Wow. And there's no way that would have ever happened in a big capacity city like Boston or LA or something, right? There'd be all these other yeah. rich people there getting in the way. But here it's, you know, it's a small <laughs> yes. enough community that great arts and culture comes through and people are accessible. And so, you know, getting to meet Winter Marsalis, getting to meet... Uh, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor at a similar event that was at the Cranert Center for Performing Arts, you know, and they had like a book signing afterwards. It's a really cool combination of like bringing in great culture uh, and still having it be accessible, uh, which I just love. So the Cranert Center, KCPA is just, just outstanding. Yes. Um, yeah, restaurants, uh, you know, um, yeah, we, uh, we like to find good food. Um, Black Dog is a favorite in our family mm -hmm. here. Pizzeria Antica is a great place also. There's other great food here too, but uh, yeah, there's there, it's nice to have some good arts, culture, and food makes uh, for good quality of life. Yes. So, uh, Professor, I think you become a, uh, at this point, you've definitely become a townie, as you know, we students call them townies. And, a townie? You know, I'll, a townie, I'll yes. that. Yeah, I'll be a townie. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, what, what's it like, you know, because students come and go every four years, mainly undergrad and then grad students, maybe two years or five years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you, you kind of just living here and see these students come and go and it's sort of like two cultural group, you know, very intelligent people, uh, students wise, but we, we just kind of live here. We never really truly interact with people that really live here, you know, like what's, what's it like, you know, from a townies perspective to see, you know, students come and go and then people living here, really living here. Yeah, well, um, you know, I've lived in lots of college towns and so I've seen that happen other places too, but I would say, um, I might, I might uh, try to balance that perspective by saying that, um, you know, some students, depending on what their interests are and how they're involved, certainly can interact with the local folks, mm -hmm. you know, so for example, the, the church I'm connected to, uh, Community United Church of Christ, which is pretty close to campus there, you know, students who connect there certainly, you know, by that sort of organization, get connected with other people who are in the local community, you know, and so, and there are similar things, you know, whether it's like a sports club you might be a part of or something, um, so there's certainly ways to do that, though I totally agree. I remember as an undergraduate feeling very similar, like, you know, having re these realizations, like as an undergraduate student, I rarely saw somebody who was over 70 years old, and I rarely saw somebody <laughs> who was under 18 years old. Like, these were just demographics that I didn't yeah. interact with at all. Yes. And so, so, I, so and that's, I think, part of your question also, right? There's the student yeah. experience compared to the, the regular experience. Um, yeah, so it, it can feel different, you know, no matter what it is, though, you know, find, uh, find people that you can connect with, you know, because, you know, from a student perspective, the friends that you make, even if, if whether it's a local person or not, you know, even if it's other students, these are relationships that last even after you leave these places. I've certainly experienced this from all of the cities where I've lived, mm -hmm. you know, there are just some people in your life that you really connect with, and then you're going to keep those connections. Um, you know, the townies here certainly move too, right? Any college yeah, town is kind of yes. a dynamic place, people moving in and out for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Well, uh, absolutely. Because, you know, uh, when I was walking down the uh, Champagne streets, when take a walk with my friends to Jarlings and then just realized, wow, like two, plus, two blocks away from the campus, this is just, it feels like a total normal suburban town, <laughs> completely outside of anything. And then you turn around, you see the Memorial Stadium right there. It just kind of reminds you, yeah, it's the university, the, the university is right there and, you know, Champagne Urbana is right there. It's definitely a surreal experience. 
So yeah. uh, I guess my last question would be, uh, what, would, what would be some of your advice for uh, either students here or incoming students, future students in U of I? Yeah, what, what's, what's some of your, some of, of your advice? Wow, that's a big one. My yeah. advice, oh, I don't know if I have anything useful to say. I mean, you know, life's amazing, right? Like you're all alive, you're all awesome, act like it. You know, like it's just, it's just such a gift that we all have, you know, and it's in, in, if you're a student who's coming into the university of Illinois, getting back to something we mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, what a great time to be alive, right? If you get to come to Illinois to study anything, you're at, you know, you're at a time of human history where we have more knowledge than we ever have before. And you get to spend time at an institution of higher learning that teaches that and is developing even more new knowledge. And if you're studying engineering, you're at one of the top engineering schools in the world at a time where we're the most technologically advanced as we've ever been. This is amazing. So find a way to take joy and satisfaction and gratitude in these fundamental facts of your experience and, uh, and use that to motivate how you spend your time and connect with people. Uh, there are great people here to connect with. Thank you so much, Professor. I think that wraps up our interview perfectly. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great weekend. Thanks, Alan. Look forward to asking you some questions too, so I can get to know you better sometime. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow. You can really feel Professor Randy's energy and his optimistic personalities throughout our talk. It is enlightening to me that even in troubled times, he still sees the bright side to continue moving forward. I'm sure we all learned something from this conversation. And thank you so much, Professor, for taking your time sharing with us. Before I introduce our next guest, ASME started a special series featuring different STEM organizations on campus. For this week, we have leaders from Women in Nuclear and American Nuclear Society joining us and sharing their experience in U of I. If you would like to know students' perspectives of their lives on campus, was better sourced than these organization leaders. Now back to After Hours. Our next guest is someone that everyone knows in Yumeki Yovai. His class is mandatory at 8 a.m. and his British accent just stands out among the professors. And lastly, everyone will remember using his software in design projects. Stay tuned in two weeks. We have Professor Michael Philpott sharing his stories with us in After Hours.